there it is. So, uh, hmm. How many of you remember what we talked about last week? Growing pains. pains. Yeah, so uh, growing pains is where we were last week. Um, We're in Acts chapter 6. I have my prize for Mr. Webb, who is not here. So, I know he likes music, so I got him an iTunes card. So he can get an album of whatever he wants. So you can pass that on to him for me. Mr. Webb guessed that it was uh, Growing Pains and not this one. Nothing to do with Kirk Cameron at all, uh, as far as Growing Pains go. But we're in Acts chapter 6, if you can turn your Bibles there. And I was thinking this week about Growing Pains, and how many of you would trade the current problems in your life, the current things that you deal with, for the things that you dealt with when you were a child? I would trade in a second. <clears throat> Amen? Um, I was just thinking, you know, when I was like eight years old, you know, the biggest concern in my life was which candy bar I was going to pick when I, when I went to the grocery store with my mom. I mean, that was like a dilemma. You know, Snickers or Skittles, you know, which way are you going to go? You might be disappointed the whole week if you choose wrong. So that was my biggest dilemma. I was thinking about, you know, junior high, and you go to the first uh, boy-girl dance, and, you know, like the big dilemma then was, which girl am I going to ask to dance with me? And it was so nerve-wracking, and so, I mean, looking back, it was so silly. But, I mean, you guys can relate to that, right? I mean, we've all been there at one point in our lives, and you're thinking, this is such a big deal, and it's like this hormone rush, and how am I going to do all this, and what if I get rejected and these things, and, and I'm thinking about back on that now, I'm like, man, I'd love for that to be my biggest, my biggest task for the week. That'd be great. You move on to high school, and it gets a little bit more serious, and um, there's all these, you know, catty relationships between everybody, and, and these petty fights, and what are my grades going to be like, and at that time, it seems like such a big deal, but now you look back on high school, and you're like, oh gosh, how did I ever worry about that stuff? Um, and then you, you eventually join the real world. Um, or if you're part of my generation, you know, when you turn 30, you join the real world, uh, or whatever it is, and, um, and then you start to experience the actual problems of life and decisions that you make actually uh, do affect everything. But um, in retrospect, it's still uh, small stuff, right? When we think about the God of the universe is on our side, it's... I, I think that when I look at my eight-year-old self picking the candy bar, I think that's how God looks at my problems when I'm in my life. And he's like, you don't know problems. You don't know problems. But I was just thinking about that. Like, that's part of growing up, isn't it? Um, as we grow up, the, the problems that we face, uh, the solutions that we need get bigger and bigger, don't they? I mean, we've all experienced that in our lives, right? Anyone just, their life just got easier and easier the older they got. Anyone with that testimony this morning? No? I didn't think so. So, <clears throat> same, same, same thing we see here in, in Acts chapter 6. And we talked about as the church grows, it uh, begins to experience more and more problems um, with that growth. And it's not necessarily that anything uh, malicious or, or, or bad is going on, but it's just part of the natural growth is that things need to change, things need to adjust within the church, And um, we see that in the book of Acts. The very first problem that they had was with this generosity. Uh, You guys remember that story with Ananias and Sapphira and and, and those things. And then last week, uh, we talked about just the church growth in general and how every time when the church grows, then the world begins to push back. And um, we talked about the fact that there's... um, The words are escaping me now, but uh, judgment and um, just pushback from the world as we go. And every time the church has grown, has seen seen this massive influx of believers in the world, there's always been martyrdom with it. There's always been um, just this kind of fighting between the worldly system and God's system. 
it's, this is just one more thing today. Uh, Acts chapter 6. We're also going to touch on Exodus 18 and Nehemiah. That should say chapters 1 through 6, but um, it says 5 through 6. So those of you that are note takers, um, you can take some pre-notes and uh, we'll just get right into it. Acts chapter 6 verse 1 says this, But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their, their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So <clears throat> we see this problem. I don't know if you guys remember all the way back the day of Pentecost. We talked about like almost 10 weeks ago at this point. Um, the day of Pentecost, there were all these different languages spoken uh, by the apostles and by the original believers, and everyone heard the great and glorious gospel of God in their own language. So there were all of these Greek Jews in the, town, in the city, and there were all of these uh, people from Jerusalem in the city. They all heard in their own language, were believed, and were saved. Um, but now it seems that it's kind of become a problem. You know, you have these, these Greek believers, and you have these Hebrew-speaking uh, believers and now there's some miscommunication. They're trying to distribute uh, the wealth that's among them. They're trying to make sure everyone's fed, make sure everyone's clothed, make sure everyone has a place to stay. And evidently, the Greek-speaking believers are, um, are kind of getting the short end of the stick. And I don't think, based off what we see in the book of Acts, that this is anything that's malicious. I don't think that they were uh, just neglecting the Greek-speaking believers. I'm just guessing that there's a miscommunication here. There's a language bridge that they're trying to cross, and um, they're having trouble doing it. So, and I think that the, the same thing can happen here. You know, miscommunication uh, can happen all the time within the church, and I would be probably pretty deluded if I, if I thought that all of you believe that Living Water Church was perfect. Um, I'd be extremely deluded <laughs> if I thought that that was true, because it's just not. Uh, we're always going to have little different ways of doing things. We're always going to have a different idea, a different uh, vision for direction for which way that we think the church should go. Um, there's always going to be small points of contention between us. And that's what we see here. Uh, look at verse 2. So the 12, that's the apostles, called a meeting of the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the Word. <clears throat> so we see here there's this issue. There's this problem. They're trying to distribute food. They're trying to do all of these different things. And the, the apostles say, well, <laughs> when it was 150 people, that were following us, maybe then 12 was enough to make sure everyone was fed and everyone was clothed and everyone had a place to stay and everyone was okay. Maybe 12 volunteers, 12 servants of God were, were sufficient, but as the church grew, now we're talking thousands. And if, if the 12 would, would just focus on feeding everyone, there's no way that they would be able to still preach and still disciple and still do all the things that are, were necessary for the church to get to the point where it was at. Um, they would spend all their time just running a food program if, if that's all they, they did. So they say, well, we need more volunteers. And I can tell you the same thing is true at Living Water Church. If it was just, just me uh, doing all the work of the church, if it was just me, you know, running dinners and doing summer of serve projects and doing all those kinds of things, there's no way. There's no way. And even if it was just the original 12 members of this church, there's no way. Uh, we would be so burnt out. And so when I say this morning that it's an honor to serve God with you guys, uh, it's an honor to worship with you guys, that's not just empty words coming from my mouth. It's truly, we have a, a church that is extremely uh, willing to give, um, not only of their money, but of their time and of their talents. And um, we just have people with servants' hearts in this church. And uh, it's, it's amazing. I'm looking at, like, I'm thinking, like, Scott and Vicki, you guys drive 40 minutes to be here? And uh, that's dedication. <laughs> 40 minutes uh, to come to this little church in Catanning, Pennsylvania. And, um, and they come and serve in Summer of Serve, and they, they do these different things, and it's, it's amazing. 
Um, and that's just one example. I mean, I could go through each and every one of you in the different ways that God has you plugged in, that God has you serving, and it's, it's wonderful uh, to serve next to you. But the fact is that as we bring in new people, we have to make sure that we involve them also. Uh, because as we grow, um, hopefully at some point we'll be big enough that uh, the people in this room won't be enough to make it all happen. That God will be moving in such a powerful way in this community that we'll need more and more volunteers. That we'll need to bring more and more people together to continue to serve. Because I don't ever want to be that church. If God would have that, have in our future to be, you know, I'm just say a 500 person church, okay? If God has that in our future, I don't want to be the 500 person church with 20 people doing everything. I don't believe that that's what God has called us to at all. Um, God has called us all to be involved in some way or another. So, <clears throat> everyone liked this idea? We're in verse 5 now. Everyone liked this idea? There we go. <clears throat> and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to butcher these names, but bear with me. Philip, Prochorus, uh, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them and laid their hands on them. And um, that's where we're going to stop right now just because I, I was reading this story and um, I just kind of saw a pattern here and it just led me to some other places in the Bible that I want to take you to also. So, big problem, right? Food distribution is, is, is not good. Um, they are... There's some contention now among the believers. They come up with the solution. We need more people to help. And, um, and God moves them uh, to bring volunteers forward. And the problem is, is solved. And we're going to see the results of that in just a little bit. Don't read ahead, people. Don't read ahead. We'll get back to it, I promise. Um, it took me back to Exodus, of all places. This was kind of the first thing that came to my mind, Exodus 18. And this is not going to be on the screen, so you just have to kind of listen to me here. Um, Exodus 18, this is after the Israelites have been set free from Egypt. Uh, if you'll remember, there's approximately like 2 million people uh, that were set free from Egypt. And Moses is the sole leader of 2 million people. And uh, at one point, he had sent his wife and kids away, I'm assuming just as a, to get them out of a potentially bad situation. And uh, his uncle, uh, or father-in-law, sorry, Jethro, uh, kind of took them in for a while, and now they're coming back to visit him in uh, chapter 18. And it says, I'm assuming when Jethro comes back, he's kind of just following Moses around, because Moses was with him for many, many years. I'm assuming they had a, a pretty close relationship. So Jethro's following Moses around, watching his daily routine, and we read this in verse 13 of chapter 18. It says this, The next day Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. They waited before him from morning until evening. So Moses is acting as the judge for the people from morning to until evening. And, and in my book, that's like from the time you wake up uh, to the time you go to bed. Because I'm assuming uh, Moses was a pretty amazing guy, but I'm assuming he still slept at night. Uh, so morning until evening, he's listening to the people's disputes. Moses or, uh, sorry, When Moses' father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he asked, what are you really accomplishing here? Why are you trying to do all this alone while everyone stands around you from morning till evening? Moses replied, because the people come to me to get a ruling from God. When a dispute arises, they come to me, and I am the one who settles the case between the quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's decrees and give them his instruction. This is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. You're going to wear yourself out, and the people too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now listen to me, and let me give you a word of advice, and may God be with you. You should continue to be the people's representative before God, bringing their disputes to him. Teach them God's decrees and give them his instructions. Show them how to conduct their lives. But select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but have them bring the major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, making their task easier for you. 
If you follow this advice, and if God commands you to do so, then you will be able to endure the pressures, and all these people will go home in peace. So we read this story. Moses is handling the disputes of two million people. I mean, can you imagine that? How many courthouses are there in like the five-county region around us? Because if you add up all those people, Allegheny County, Westmoreland, Butler, Indiana, Armstrong, if you add up like all those people, and include the south of Pittsburgh too, I believe, it's about two million people, uh, Pittsburgh and the surrounding area. So all of those people, could you, who wants to be that judge? Uh, you just sit down in uh, Point, Point Park in Pittsburgh, and uh, they just line up just thousands upon thousands, and you just sit there morning till night. You got a little tent there. Uh, you go in and sleep, and you come out in the morning, and they're all, they're all still there. And uh, Jethro says, man, this is stupid. You're not accomplishing anything, man. If you want to move, if you want to advance on, you need some help. And so he gives him this advice, and lo and behold, Moses, Moses tells him. Moses listened to his father-in-law's advice and followed his suggestions. He chose capable men from all over Israel and appointed them as leaders over the people. He put them in charge of groups of 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. These men were always available to solve the people's common disputes. They brought the major cases to Moses, but they took care of the smaller matters themselves. And soon after this, Moses said goodbye to his father-in-law, who returned to his own land. So Jethro comes in, has this great idea. Moses implements it, and, and boom, everything is, is solved. Um, the, the issue of Moses' time being taken up constantly is solved. And uh, we're going to come back to this, too. So I'm just giving you some background on these stories. Yes, Bobby. Uh, you think that's how the stuff like presidents and senates and stuff were born? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at how the United States government is set up, that's exactly what I think the founders used. Is they looked at something like this and said, well, we need a small local government. Uh, then we need a state government above that. Then we need a federal government above that. And um, that is how they set it up. So, yeah, it's a good observation. Um, the last story here is the story of Nehemiah. Um, many of you have probably heard this. Some of you maybe have not. <clears throat> uh, Nehemiah, this is after now uh, the people of Israel, after the time of the kings and after God brings judgment and Israel is exiled under the control of, of Babylon. And Nehemiah was one of the servants of the king, Artaxerxes, who was um, just basically the leader of this Babylonian empire. And uh, Nehemiah is serving under him as, as a slave, essentially, um, but uh, an Israelite, uh, someone who remembers uh, being taken out of captivity. And it says here that Nehemiah heard one day, it says, They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. So they were beginning to send some people back to Jerusalem at this point. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. And so Nehemiah has this great burden then for the city of Jerusalem, this once shining city, God's city, where the temple is. Uh, all, the, all the gates, which are wooden gates made out of huge wooden beams, have been burned, and the, the stone walls have been literally torn down. And it's greatly distressing to Nehemiah because they're sending people back, and the people around them still don't really like Israel. Okay, so they can come in and, and uh, raid whenever they want to. They can come in and, uh, and, and, and kill people, attack, pillage, whatever. Um, they're completely unprotected because they have no wall anymore. So Nehemiah has this burden. Um, he goes to Artaxerxes and, and he, he asks permission to go back. And, and he allows him to, gives him wood to rebuild the gates and sends Nehemiah back. And uh, I think this is really really awesome because we see this Moses, big problem, right? Moses gets volunteers, problem so solved. Uh, Nehemiah now, really big problem. Jerusalem is no small city, and to rebuild these walls around Jerusalem is, a, is quite a task. Um, one man, it would take uh, many, many years probably, uh, maybe a lifetime to build those lot walls by yourself. But uh, Nehemiah says this, uh, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. He's talking to the people now in Israel. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. And the people replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. And so they began the good work. 
Uh, he, he recruits these people and something moves in the spirit and they say, yes, we want to we wanna be involved, we want to help, and it's just like immediately they start stacking stones. They, they go to work right away and I'm not going to go through all the details, but uh, if you read through chapter 3 in Nehemiah, if you've never read the story, just read it this week, chapters 1 through 6. It's really an uh, interesting piece of the history of Israel, but it says, you know, the fish gate was built by the sons of uh, Hasana, and it goes through all these different gates that they had different names for. The fish gate, the old city gate, um, the dung gate. Who wants to volunteer to rebuild the dung gate? That's a good one, right? Um, but all these different places and different sections of the wall, there's the broad wall, and, and it goes through all these different things. And if you ever wonder if the Bible is true or not, if you ever have that, that uh, thought comes into your mind, go read a book like this. Because if this was just a story book, they would never put this detail in there. Because um, it's kind of boring to read. But it's also interesting uh, in the fact that they were very detailed in how they kept records of who, of who did this. But it wasn't just Nehemiah and this small group that he talked to in the beginning. It was like as they saw one little piece of work being done, another group saw it and said, well, I can do this section. And another one said, well, this wall is part of my house. I'll rebuild this section. And, the next, and another group steps up and another group and another group. And we see the result in chapter 6. This is amazing. It says, so on October 2nd, the wall was finished just 52 days after we had begun. 52 days. Jerusalem's a big city. They rebuild the walls and all the gates in 52 days, uh, completely fortified. Uh, that's astonishing. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. And so this kind of leads me to my three points because we're always talking... I don't know about you guys, but I, I have like lone wolf syndrome, okay? I want to just do it on my own sometimes. I just want to be alone. I want to work alone. I want to just go and do it because I, I feel like, um, well, I'll make that point later. But anyway, I just want to do things by myself. So, and, and you may be that way too. Uh, but God calls us to work together. And I'm trying to think, you know, what are the reasons that we would work together? And so these three stories, as we look at the conclusions of the three stories, uh, we'll kind of see that. And I kind of already gave away the first one. But number one, it makes the work lighter. I mean, we have seen this over and over again with summer reserve projects. I have scheduled eight hours to do, do things, and we'll get them done in two. And it's just silly. Uh, you know, I, I'm picturing... I'm saying even if we get 10 people, it will take eight hours to do this job. And we get 10 people, uh, just what I thought, and it takes two hours. And I would love for it to just be that we're really hard workers and we're really good at what we do and uh, we're just really special, but I don't think that's the case. I think that when we get together and we do work that's going to glorify God, I believe that he comes and partners alongside us and supernaturally uh, allows us to finish faster than we would have by ourselves. And I can guarantee if I would have torn down that garage by myself, it would have taken me days to tear it down and load it up and clean everything and, and drive the truck up to the park and, and do all these different things. It would have taken me a long, long time to do it by myself. And if we would just divide that by how many people that we had, um, there's no way that I could have even done it in that much time. I mean, God like compressed it down so far uh, that we finished way faster than we ever should have. Um, and that's happened several times. Uh, that happened with the yards the first time that we did them. There's no way that that was just four hours worth of work. There's no way. <laughs> and we did it in four hours. And God gave us cloud cover the entire time and then opened up the skies and gave us sun as we left. I mean, it was just amazing how, how God partners and blesses us as we as we work for him and i know we're going to continue to see that the more that we work together all the little projects that jim and i have done around the church things that um i don't think you know 
he has no business doing with only one helper uh, and one helper that's uh, not very talented at different things. And yet God blesses the work. Every time that we do it, uh, we finish the, the task that God has assigned us. And, uh, and it's amazing how God blesses when even just two people uh, get together and do his work. So that's the first thing. It makes the work lighter. I have never done a project with Living Water Church with you guys and felt like I was doing work. I can't explain that. Because I could do the exact same project for another organization, not trying to be a blessing to the kingdom in some way, and it would be drudgery. But when I'm working with the people of God, God does something in your spirit to lift you up, and you can work harder, you can uh, be better, just, just because you're there with the people of God and the Holy Spirit himself. How many, can, how many can attest to that? Amen? And uh, that's just how God does it. He makes the work lighter. And we see that with Nehemiah. I just love that. They, <laughs> when the, our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of God. And that's my kind of prayer for the community, that as they see all these different projects being done, as they see all these different things, um, they'll, they'll be a little bit humiliated. I don't want them to feel like completely humiliated, but I do want them to feel like, wow, we could have been doing that all this time. We could have been helping these people all this time, and here we were just sitting on our butts. And this little church in Catani comes out of nowhere, and here, gosh, there's stuff getting done. Stuff getting done around here. I want them to see that, and I want them to be, to be in awe of what God is doing. That, that's a good thing. Let's go back to Exodus now, chapter 18. And I never realized this until I started reading this, because I was reading this, I said, God, I can kind of see... Uh, the correlation between the two and it was like God said okay just read a little bit further now read a little bit further and I look in Exodus 18 and that story just ends right just says soon after this Moses said goodbye to his father-in-law who returned to his own land but look at chapter 19 this is the very next thing and I just think this is so cool Um, the Bible is in order for a reason I really believe that I don't think God was um Just put it together randomly. I I don't believe that. Uh, This is so awesome. Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai after breaking camp at Rephidim. Uh, They came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. This is like a momentous occasion in, in Israel's history. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on the earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So, if Moses was taking petty court cases from morning until evening, when do you think he would have had time for this? Never. He would have never had time to climb the mountain and seek the face of God. I think that's just amazing that those two stories are right back to back. That, that Moses is completely consumed with this job of leading his people God gives him a reprieve through this plan of a man that we don't even know uh, his, his religious background other than that he glorified God because of all the, the things that he did with this nation. But God gives him a plan through his father-in-law. He puts it in place and God uses that free time to, to allow Moses to seek his face, to allow Moses to come face to face with the God of the universe and hear directly from him. And that's the second thing here. Working together allows us to seek God's face. Um, I don't believe <laughs> that the nation of Israel would have, uh, I mean, right after this is, is when God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. I mean, where would our Bible be without the Ten Commandments? <laughs> That's amazing that, that, that God frees up his time and then Moses uses that extra time to seek God's face. Um, who in our congregation needs to seek God's face? Is it just the pastor? It's not just me. Praise God, it's not just me. It's everybody. 
So as, as God frees up your time, as, as, God, as we serve together, which allows us to complete the work quicker, God will free up your time to seek his face. This is where I was going to make my point um, that I was going to say earlier. Remember what Moses said when, when Jethro suggested to him? Uh, he said, because the people come to me to get a ruling from God. When a dispute arises, they come to me, and I am the one who settles the case between the quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's decrees and give them his instructions. People come to me. They come to me. I am the one. I am the one. And I am so quick to fall into that trap. Um, I, I can very easily come to the point where I think that Andy is the only one who could possibly do this job. So Andy needs to do it. And that's, that's pride, people. I don't know if you're the same as me, but um, I can get, quickly get into that mentality, especially if someone makes a mistake or someone does something that I wouldn't do it that way or whatever, then I'm like, ah, oh, just get out of the way, I'll do it. I'll do it. And um, maybe part of that is the function of kind of how, how I was raised. Um, but uh, I don't know. It's just pride welling up in me. And uh, so if you're that way, invite people to come alongside you. Uh, be okay with their mistakes. I'm, I'm sure that not every judgment that the people made was the same one that Moses would have made, uh, but it was necessary for him to let go of some of the smaller things so that he could focus on the bigger things, seeking God's face. Amen? Okay. Finally, let's finish. Let's go back to Acts chapter 6. Look how this story ends. So God, God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. When we work together, when we volunteer together, it advances the kingdom of God. It advances the kingdom of God. Now think about this. What, <laughs> what did they do? They just did a food program, right? I mean, it wasn't some big spiritual thing that they did. It was very practical, just making sure that the food was distributed evenly among everybody. I mean, where's the spirit in that? I don't know. It's just a physical job. It was probably laborious. It was probably difficult just to deal with people's complaints and... and um, you're dealing with a lot of new believers and, and there's a lot of issues that, that people are probably bringing to you as you go around and take, the, take this food around. But it's <clears throat> just a physical job. They were giving, yeah. So what I want to say about all this, I, I don't ever want you to feel like your contribution doesn't matter because it does. All the little things... The, it just freed up the apostles' time to preach and to disciple and to do all of these things, but they could not have done that without someone doing the food program. It all is intertwined together. Anything that you do for the church, anything that you do uh, to come alongside the ministry that's happening at Living Water will advance the kingdom just as much as me standing up here preaching a message will. I believe that with all my heart. We need preachers and we need people to clean the toilets. And that's just the reality of it, okay? And sometimes we need people that are willing to do both. <laughs> Amen? Uh, the, I don't think that the preacher should walk around, you know, in his white suit and uh, his, his gloves and not, not be willing to touch anything dirty. And I hope that I've, that I've set a good example for you there. Um, uh, every, every job, I take the dirtiest one, don't I, Jim? Um, you know, he makes me go up and play with the insulation while he stands on the outside cutting the holes. But uh, that's neither here nor there. There's no contention between us. I'm not bitter about it. Um, <laughs> but we need to realize that there's no contribution that's greater than another. Um, I don't feel as though I'm more important that because I have the privilege to give the word, and you shouldn't feel that I'm more important either. Uh, you should realize that it's, that it's just as important for someone to make the coffee as it is for someone to preach the gospel. Um, 
because there, there's, there's a way there that you are preaching the gospel. You're freeing up time uh, for other people that I don't have to come in here at 7 o'clock and make the coffee and do the words and do all that different stuff. We can share all of these things and we'll all have more time to seek the face of God because of that. Amen? Amen. So don't ever feel like, uh, this is the other thing, don't ever feel like you shouldn't get involved because you're not talented enough or you're not uh, gifted in some certain area or you don't like to talk to people or whatever it is that, that the devil has that he's preaching to you that is hanging you up from getting involved. Don't let those things stop you because it's a, it's a lie. It's a lie. Uh, there is a job for everybody. There is a, there is a place in ministry for everyone. There is something that you can do to, to come alongside and to help advance the kingdom of God, no matter who you are, uh, no matter how God has gifted you. Um, just come and see me. <laughs> uh, we'll talk. We'll find a place for you to serve in the church. There's things that we do that you probably don't even know that we do. There's things that we need that you probably don't even know that we need. And until someone steps up, then we'll be able to fill that. <clears throat> My favorite preacher is Paul Washer. Um, a lot of you know that. And he told a story one time that I'm just going to kind of paraphrase. He was discipling this young man who said, um, you know, I've just been praying that God would make me this great traveling evangelist. That God would just, just, just bring up this fire within me and that I would just see thousands of people saved through my ministry. And he, he came back and he said, <laughs> I just love this. He said, have you ever thought that maybe you should be praying that your friend would become a really great traveling evangelist and that you'd be able to carry his luggage? <laughs> have you ever considered that? Because <clears throat> I think we all want to be something big. We all want to do something great for God. We all want to be that person maybe out front who's, who's, the, who's the star of the show. But... Just pray that God would put you in the place that he has for you. Be satisfied with the thing that God gives you. Um, I was the last person who ever wanted the job that I ended up with. We were just talking last night, my wife and I. I was like, how did this happen? We didn't want this. <laughs> we just wanted a nice, quiet life by the river. But God... God has different plans. He has different plans for you. Um, so I just want to encourage you. There's, there's two summer serve projects left on the table there. Um, there's a Habitat Day. And what's the one I'm missing? Someone help me. Yeah, cutting the grass again. Taking care of the yards one more time. Which, by the way, I sprayed weed killer. I killed that whole yard. It's dead. So... Uh, <laughs> So we might only have four next time. Uh, but neither here nor there. Uh, sign up for these projects. Get involved. Even if you're just the person that makes sure everyone's hydrated, that's okay. We need that person too. If it will lighten the burden of everyone else, then by all means, come out. If you're not sure how to get involved, get in touch with me. I printed a new schedule today. Do you have that? Uh, Sharon has it. There's spaces on there where we're kind of adjusting now. Notice we don't do snacks in the morning anymore. That's by design. It's not that we forgot to bring snacks. Uh, but we need someone to make coffee and greeter. We, we combine those two jobs. If you feel like you could turn on a coffee pot and be nice to people, that's for you. Donovan did it, Donovan did it this morning. Yes, he did. It's full. It's full. Well, if you need, if you, if you would like a job, if you're, if you're wondering, how can I get involved, please see me. <laughs> please see Luke. Please see Sharon. Please see anyone here uh, that has uh, a connection to that calendar. We want to get you on there. Um, we, need, uh, we need more kids uh, teachers. We need some people in the nursery. Uh, we need more people to learn how to do words and sound. Uh, we need more people that can be worshipers. We need people that are going to plan prayer walks. I mean, how awesome is that? That was just an idea that God gave them, and they brought it to me, and here, we did it. It was great. It was awesome. And I didn't have to be a part of it at all. And that's how it should be. You know, let God give you an idea, bring it to us, and we'll make it happen. And God will get all the glory. 
Amen? Amen. So get involved. That's all I just want to just sign up for summer of serve. Sign up for a job in the church. We'll equip, we'll equip you. God will be blessed and his kingdom will be advanced through whatever level of service you can muster. I promise. I promise you will be. Um, if you're here this morning and you're just concerned about the, the status of your soul and you want someone to talk about that with, I want you to let, know that I'm available. Uh, you can call me on my cell phone throughout the week. Um, you can call uh, my office, my State Farm office downtown. I'll be more than happy to take some time and talk to you. Um, my schedule has been freed up. Uh, God has blessed me with uh, Luke, who's come and helped me now at work. And um, God is making good things happen there. And I believe that, uh, that Living Waters is just getting started. God is just, just allowing us to see a glimpse of how he can use us when we come together for the advancement of his kingdom. So just continue uh, to have that attitude of service. Amen? Let's pray. God, we just pray that uh, you would just continue to bless us with your presence. The worship, Lord. <laughs> When we worship you as a group of people, I can just feel you in this building. You're just fusing together, fusing us together as individuals through your Holy Spirit. And that's what we want. That's what we need, God. Show us how to move forward. There's just a few weeks left in the summer of serve. And um, we need to know where to go from here. So I pray that you would give, you'd give me ideas, give me a plan, but even more importantly, God, that as each one of us seeks your face, that you'd give all of us the way forward, that you'd allow us to move together in a spirit of unity, that you would bless us as we come together and work, that you would continue to supernaturally uh, cause things to get done in this community uh, with your power uh, through our hands. God, we just praise you for all that's happened, for all that you're doing, for all that you will do. I put people in our paths this week that have heard about what Living Water is doing and give us the boldness uh, to tell them the truth about you, about the fact that it's all happening because of this great and mighty God and what he has done through his glorious son, Jesus Christ. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.